bright, shiny faces. Good morning to you and you and you. And good morning to all of you. Good morning, Ronnie. Good morning, John Wyman. Good morning, Catalina and Jeremiah. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, Grace Community Church. Yay! Hello, happy Eclipse Sunday. Is this like the coolest? Northern Maine is the place to be for once. Like, shout out to all our Northern Maine friends. Yes. And, you know, we as well. Very close to Northern Maine. Um, I just want to say good morning to everybody. Oh, I think I already did that. And let's have a word of prayer real quickly. Dear Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you bring us together to be family, to be community. Lord, to learn more about you, to learn more about the people you put in our lives right around us and how to serve them better for your glory, for your kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we thank you. Amen. All right, and welcome to everybody online eating breakfast, and we enjoy you too. All right, first of all, I have a fidget toy here. No, it's not really a fidget toy. It is some anonymous person in our midst has an amazing talent to make bookmarks, and they've been sitting here for a little bit, but if you guys want a bookmark for your whatever, but for your good book, I have a good book. Um, yes, we have bookmarks to pass out. Thank you for sharing your talent. All right. And next up, Family Discipleship Night would, yes, hoo hoo. The next one would be Friday evening, six o'clock. Um, Friday. April 19th, which is at the end of school vacation. If you subscribe to Celebrating School Vacation, it's within you know, your, your means, then it is that Friday night ending school vacation at six o'clock right here. Family in our vocabulary means anyone who has the means to come and be part of this church family. You do not have to have descendants or ancestors attached to you, you can just be a person yourself, coming and enjoying being part of family fellowship. Um, the question this week, we're going through a catechism and every month we have a different question. This month is, what does the law of God require? Don't worry, I have the answer printed. The answer is that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and Love our neighbor as ourselves. And the memory verse, Matthew 22, 37. Anybody want to say it? Don't worry, I have that printed too. All right, Matthew 22, 37 is the memory verse. It says, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And thank you to the Baileys who usually organize that evening for us. And not that you've had enough of me talking, but a drum roll for Bruce Coughlin, please. Oh, I'm on the sound system. No, I'll drum roll this way so I don't blow your ears out. All right. All right, everybody glad to be here. <laughs> That's as close to Cheryl as I could come. <laughs> I emailed her during the week and said I'm practicing, but I don't think I've quite got it yet, so... It is what it is. Some of us just don't have that in us. We have to work up to that. So um, even, even I remember a pastor one time saying, we get all excited about sports events and things like that and concerts and we yell and scream. And I thought to myself, no, I don't know. That's not me even then. You know, when the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in 86 years, I said, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So... <clears throat> So what I just did was really out of character. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm working at it, Cheryl. You're a good, I didn't say you're a good example, but we don't want to encourage you too much here. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to pay for a couple things. One, Hannaford Help Schools we talked about last week. And uh, I did notice there was a coupon in the box down there already. So good job, somebody. Um, I didn't bring up any um, 
articles this week, but um, Pastor Jeremy and Ben did a good job of reprising the roles of, um, who was that, on The Price is Right. They would stand in front of the showcase and say, this is whatever type of thing. No, I was thinking of Carol and Holly, but, you know, (laughs) you only got so much to work with, so they did well with that. So this month, the month of April, is Step Up for Students at Grace Christian Academy Month. In the past, I think Ben mentioned a couple weeks ago, in the past we used to have pay down the mortgage for the mortgage on the church. And over the years, we shaved about three or four years, I think it was, off the mortgage by doing that. Well, we're turning it around this, this time to help out students at the school in particular, but other ways that you would like to help out as well. So, have you ever had some bad news to give to somebody, and when you gave it, their response was a blessing to you? It doesn't happen that often. But this past week was the beginning of parent-teacher conferences. Now, I don't get on, in on that part because I'm not teaching. But the school committee, we took it upon ourselves this year to talk with the parents afterwards about the importance of re-enrolling their students for next fall and for encouraging others to come to the school. So part of it was we had to tell them that tuition was going up a couple hundred bucks for next year because of rising costs, and everybody knows that. And they understood that. But after that, they said, we're just so glad the school is here. It's been a blessing to us. We're just thankful that our son or daughter can come here to school. We've got another one in the pipeline shortly. In another year or so, we've got another little one coming. And uh, we heard that from several different places. So when you get to share bad news about the increase of cost and you hope the parents just, you know, at least nod and say, yeah, we, we'll do that or whatever, it's nice to hear that their children, their family is being blessed by their children attending school here. So it's, it's really important that we support the school in whatever way we can. So we we'll Step Up for Students... If you, when you came in this morning, if you got a bulletin down that end, you got one of these things in it. If you got a bulletin at that end, you probably didn't. How many didn't get one of these when they came in? Ronnie, where are you? Raise your hand, and Ronnie's going to come by, and she's going to give you one of these. <clears throat> so what you're getting, and you, you can read it uh, on your own time, not while somebody up here is talking or you're supposed to be singing or anything. <clears throat> but we're ty- it's the cost of school, like everything else, has gone up. There was a big increase last year, and it was a much smaller one this year, but it's still an increase. And everything else, as you guys are aware of every day, is going up as well. But So, so we're going to give you the opportunity to help out. On the back side of this, for a couple years now at our annual business meeting, some one person, and I won't mention her name, but she's really close to me right now, um, has asked what the, what the cost of the school is. How much, what are the finances of Grace Christian Academy? So I asked Ruth to uh, Andreessen, who's our treasurer, to come up with something that we could put on here so you get an idea of what the cost is of running the school. Now, most our fiscal year is from July 1st to June 30th. The, everybody else is, 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 runs on a calendar year. So what we did is I got the information from her, and then I tried to work it as somewhat as a, the calendar year of 2023. So on the back here is a general idea. <clears throat> this wouldn't hold up to an audit or anything like that, but it gives you a general idea of what it costs to, to run the school and where the money comes from. Now, God has greatly blessed us over the years, and we, met, we meet payroll every week. Uh, we pay the bills, uh, usually on time. Ruth is a remarkable treasurer because she talks about 
I don't know how we're going to meet payroll this week. And then the next week she says, well, this money came in. These parents paid up. This was done. This was done. And it's like, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for providing for another week. And that's how we operate. It's a very slim margin there. So this is an idea of what it costs. And the last two categories, yearbook fund and sports fund, are not from any school funding. It's we raise the money through sports or selling of ads, and that's how the yearbook and sports are paid for. So there's, nothing, there's not enough money to do that in the regular what comes in. Now, so you can read that if you've been reading it while I've been talking or whatever. In, in, the, in the seat in front of you, most of you, in that little pocket there where you, a couple weeks ago, a month ago, they put the little cardboard thing in there, talk about the church, there's an envelope. It's got a nice, nice picture of a kid, or in this one, it's kind of a funny picture of a kid with a coonskin hat and a mustache on. I think he was in second grade at the time, but anyway. And then on the other side is a way that you can give specific ways you can give to the school. Now, if you want to give us money for anything else, we'll take it. It's not a problem. We'll find a use for it. But here are some specific ways that you can give. We're looking particularly at the scholarship fund. We had approximately, for this school year, approximately $12,000 from scholarship, for scholarships. They were all used up amongst 10 kids, I think it was. There's been other money given along the line, along the way to help uh, parents as well. If somebody's behind, people have given money to help those people catch up and that kind of thing. But here's a specific way that you can make a commitment, whether it's a one-time thing this month or so much a month over the next year, but for the scholarship fund. And... If there's something else you'd like to give for, just make a note on the check that it goes for whatever. These can go in the box over there where you're, if you give uh, with actual cash or checks, you can put them in the box over there, one of these, and Brenda or she or Anna or whoever sorts through the stuff in the box, she will pass them on to Ruth for the school. And you can do that every month or just on your check, make a notation of what it's for. Back... 35 years ago, I was on the board of Fairhaven Camps over in Brooks. And this is my camp story. Ben's got piles of them. i got a few, too. But just this one. We had an elderly lady. And to me, I was in my 20s at the time, so she might have been 50 for all I know. But she was, <clears throat> she was referred to as an elderly lady. And she's a young lady now, I guess, in my book. But she used to give, at that time, I think it was $5 a month to help out Camp Fairhaven. Now, $5 a month isn't a whole lot. It wasn't then, it isn't now. But she'd been doing it for like 25 years. So she was faithful. She saw the ministry there, the needs there, and she wanted to help. And she th all she could do, she must have been old. She was on, on limited uh, income. So she gave $5 a month, and that was the way that she could help out Camp Fairhaven. Maybe that's all you can do. Uh, that's fine. But... This, and this is above and beyond what you normally give here. So if it's not your tithe, it's not your offering that you would normally give on a regular Sunday or regular monthly giving. This is above and beyond that. And it will be very much appreciated. If you have any way you would like to help in any other way, um, please talk to one of us on the school committee. If you have any questions about this or what you see on, on here, uh, don't hesitate to ask. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, but most of all, everybody, one of my favorite songs in Southern Gospel music is, I Can Pray. I may not be able to, you know, preach up here. I may not be able to sing great. I may not be able to do any number of these, teach school, but I can pray. So whether you're giving to the school or you're not giving to the school, pray for us. We've got some wonderful kids. We've got some fantastic teachers. Wanda comes in in pain half the time, and that's before she works with the kids. Say nothing but what you like afterwards, but they do a great job. We're blessed to have them and all the people that do help out. So pray about it. See what the Lord would have you do, and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, and also, he mentioned tithes, and we don't always um, say it, but there is a box in the back corner. We um, have stopped putting the plate, you know, like some churches pass the plate, and we just have a tithe box there. It's between you and God and uh, tithes and offerings and all of that. Um, and another, I think most of you have been here long enough to know, but also we have nursery up until age five, and nursery kids leave after um, the first three songs. And then we have, have nursery and go fetch your kid during the last song. Okay, and thank you to all the nursery helpers. Uh, I have one other family meeting. We are going to have a family meeting. Remember I just said, you know, what is family? Family means all of us. Um, and so all of us have a meeting. If you have questions that you're like, hey, what about, you know, how do you run your nursery? Or what about, you know, like things like that. Like I just said, you know, if you're not familiar, this is how we do things. This is a time where you can come and it's um, kind of informal. It's not our annual business meeting, but it's just like an open town meeting kind of style where you can say, hey, whatever. Um, and it's an open discussion. It's not actually a church service, so that will be directly after church on April 21st. Yep, all right. Hearing no other uh, replies, our scripture today is 1 John 3, 11 to 18, which coincides nicely with the women's breakfast Bible study yesterday of 1 John 3. So very good. All right. 1 John 3. Uh, oh, and the internet is kind of funky today. If people have digital Bibles, I would like to hear pages flipping this morning. All right. So 1 John is way towards the back, but not quite to Revelation. All right. Right before 2 and 3 John. I know. I heard somebody saying it in their mind. Yeah. See, you're grinning. Yeah. All right. Did I give you enough time to flip there? All right, 1 John 3, 11 to 18. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we, live the, we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever, uh, everyone who hates his brothers is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers." But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The word of the God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. That's the most enthusiasm you'll see from me this morning, too. <laughs> I'm with you, Bruce. <laughs> Let's stand and sing worship songs to the Lord this morning.
on or is this on? Yeah. Move that, okay. You got me today. Um, so we often pray for churches in our area. I think it's really awesome and exciting and something we should do. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment this morning and pray for our church um, because I think that's important too. So I'm going to pray for all aspects. And this is kind of basically what I do at our elders meeting is if I'm praying, I often pray. It's kind of the same thing. So um, it's important for us as a church to pray um, for each other and for our leadership and everything. It's kind of awkward because I am leadership, but I'll, you know, we'll just skip that part. But um, anyway, let's, let's just pray for our body this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the group of people you've put together here. Uh, we thank you for building your church and for having a purpose and for a intent for your church and not just a, a, a gathering for the fun of gathering, Lord. We thank you that we're here for a reason. Um, the reason is you and the reason is to um, bring your message to the world. We just pray for opportunities to do that. We pray for the desire to do that. Um, and we pray that you will just um, put the right people in place from our body to um, effectively communicate your message to the outside world. Um, we thank you for our leadership, and we thank you for our pastor, and uh, um, what he means to our church. We thank you for all of the, the work he puts in. We just pray for your um, protection around him and around the rest of our leadership, elders and deacons, um, all the way down, Lord. Everybody that serves this church, um, for your glory, we just thank you for them, and uh, we just pray that we can continue to um, grow, continue to learn about you and to love you and that have that be the basis for our growth. Um, again, we thank you for loving us, for bringing everybody here uh, right now for a purpose and for a reason. And uh, we love you. pray this in your name. Amen. I know there's um, a lot of people in this room that have come face to face with death this year, whether it's been an experience for yourself or someone that you love. Um, this is a reminder of where our hope is. And I hope that as you continue to confront those scenarios in your life, that you can stand on this rock of hope and say, this is, this is my life, this is what it means, and this is what the life, of come, what life to come means. Three, four, uh, sorry, it's in threes. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. 
forgot we got a rotation. <laughs> so. <laughs> Come on, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Why does he not have five arms? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One, two, three, four. <laughs> seated.
Hi again. Hi. <coughs> Do you ever feel like there should be walk-up music, like a wrestling match? <laughs> you pass from the stage. Kind of music is. <coughs> it's just an idea. It doesn't have to. But. Next time you preach. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good morning, everyone. All right. So we're in Genesis still. Um, I told Jeremy this works out really great for me. Like we spend a week on Passover and then a week on Easter and talking about the glory of the resurrection and the risen Christ. And then I get to come up here and I get to talk about murder and death and killing. So <clears throat> it's really great. It's good. Um, I'm going to try and keep it like slightly happy, but it's, it's just not. I can't do it. Sorry. It's not going to be happy. Now if it is happy, you're going to be like, oh, you undersold yourself. But anyway. <laughs> Also, it's nice that the live stream is not working today. We're recording it. So if this is really bad, he's going to edit it. <clears throat> and so if you're not happy with how today's goes, you know, just you can watch the edited version in a couple days and be like, oh, that was better. He did a good job. That was all not true, by the way. It's just, I'm just joking. I don't think it'll be edited. <laughs> yes, the live stream is down. Yeah. So. Um, let's see. I should get my notes out, probably, so we don't just go everywhere. My mother's going to be disappointed that the live stream is not up. I'm surprised she hasn't texted me and asked where it is yet. Um, but I will say hi to her now, and then I'll call her later and talk to her. And so when she watches this in a couple days, I won't have to call her because I'll already say hi to her. So it works out well. It works. It works good. Yeah. I don't want to get her too used to that, so let's not do that. Um, all right, so Genesis chapter 4 is where we're going to start today. Um, why don't we have a quick word of prayer, and then I'll, I'll start what we have. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the time we have here this morning. Uh, we thank you for your word, even the hard, um, not pleasant parts. And we just pray that you um, will show us what you want us to get out of this. And uh, we just thank you for um, the opportunity to be here. We love you. pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 4. What we've covered in Genesis so far is creation and the fall, and that's where we have stopped. Um, so if you look, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, um, we're kind of in the part of the story where, where Frodo has just left the Shire. He doesn't think it's going to be that bad. Like, he's like, oh, you know, it's a journey, but it's cool. And then this is the part of the story where it starts to get really bad. So this would be like the realization moment of like, oh, this is going to be hard. Like, man, this is, this is, this is not good. Um, so, the first thing I'm going to do this morning, um, we'll read verse 1 of chapter 4, and then we'll go from there. It says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Whoa, that was loud. I apologize. <laughs> Saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel, and now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. So, I'm just going to get this out of the way because it's going to make my life a lot easier to just do this right up front. Um, so what I'm going to say right now, like you need to understand, there, like this isn't disunity. Like you need to hear that, all right? Um, I have a differing opinion than some of the other interpretations that have been given up here. So Paul, or Paul, I think Jeremy said it too. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying I'm different. Um, and you can look at me and think, like obviously I'm different, right? Bruce is like, amen, brother. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. I wasn't expecting that much. But anyway, <clears throat> the timeline of Genesis is very muddled, you would say. Um, and because part of that is because the book, the purpose of Genesis isn't to give us an exact time-by-time -time thing. This is how this happened, this is how this happened, and this is how this happened. Um, Genesis is written to a people, a particular people, for a particular purpose. And that's tell them who they are and where they came from and how they got here. And so I'm not convinced that Cain and Abel were born after the fall. Um, I think you can read it and you can look at it, I, this is how I look at it, as they were possibly born in the garden um, before the fall. Pat, you came back. Cool. <laughs> I thought he left because I said something. It's fun. Um, so why do I think that? I just do. All right. No, I'm just kidding. Um, during the curse where, where God tells Eve, he says, hold on, it's 3, let's see, 3.16. 
Um, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring forth children. The word multiplying there indicates to me that it's an increase in pain. Um, and that, that she has had children before, it maybe didn't hurt as much, and part of this curse is that, okay, that, that what you just did, that was, you know, not pleasant, it's going to be a lot worse. By the way, I've seen that five times now. I still don't understand it. Like, birth, I, I, have, I have no idea how it works, though. Like, it doesn't make sense. So anyway, um, <clears throat> Cain's name makes sense to me, by the way, while we're on that, because she says, I have gotten a uh, man with the help for the Lord. Like, clearly God had to help that. <laughs> like, she understood. She was like, yeah, I couldn't do this by myself. Um, so anyway, so like I'm saying, like, it's not that I'm, I'm not um, disagreeing. Like, we've talked about this as elders, and it's fun. It's a fun conversation. Be like, well, I think, wait, nobody said I think you're wrong. Um, because I think it could go either way. This is just how I think. And ultimately, this is where it comes down to, it doesn't really matter that much when they were born. If they were born before the fall or after the fall, it's just like a timeline thing. Um, so we're well, going to come back to that a little bit later, but I'll just get it out of the way, and then maybe we can keep going with the story. So the bottom line is that Cain and Abel are the first recorded children we have in the Bible. And so Genesis, obviously, is a story of firsts. There's a lot of firsts here, so we're going to see a bunch of firsts today. And the first first is the first children. Man, that is a lot of firsts. <laughs> I like it. So, we've got Cain and we've got Abel. They're the first named children. I don't know if they were the first born children. I'm not sure. It doesn't actually say that. We know that Adam and Eve had other kids. We're going to get to that a little bit later, too. Um, but for this story, this is the first. And part of the other reason, like, I think this could be possible if they were born pre-fall. I know, like, chronologically, we're reading it, and you have creation, you have the fall, then you have children. Um, but Genesis oftentimes reads a little bit different than that, where, like, we saw creation, we saw man created, and then we, we kind of zoomed in on man and spent more time on it. But it wasn't like man was created twice. It was just two different views on it. And so this could be another one of those sections where we have creation, we have the fall, and, oh, by the way, zoom in and look Sometime in here, at, um, Cain and Abel were born. <clears throat> so, let's just keep going. After I drink some water. So we have Cain, we have Abel, they're brothers. I don't know how old they are. I have no idea. Actually, I have an idea. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later, too. But they're at least old enough to work in the field and take care of animals. Now, I grew up on a farm. I was around cows when I was very young, um, but I would not say I was capable of taking care of, they were not my responsibility, um, my sole responsibility, which it sounds like they were of Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Um, you've got to be somewhat large to take care of sheep, or somewhat of a, you know, muscular adult, I would say, um, because if you ever tried to wrestle a sheep, they can beat you, um, and they can hurt you. They will. Anyway, that <laughs> sounded a lot more ominous than I meant it to say. But um, <clears throat> So we've got Cain and Abel. Cain works the ground. Abel is a keeper of the sheep. So we'll keep going with the story. We have the characters set. And it says, In the course of time, Cain brought, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. That sounds painful. <clears throat> the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will not you be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. This desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So, this um, is another first. We see this is the first offering um, offered by man. We know it in Genesis 3, where God... Um, sacrifices the animals to make clothes for Adam and Eve, but this is the first account we have of man offering to God. And I'm sure it's happened in here before. Um, this is not the first time they've done this. That's something important to realize. Um, what we don't see in this time period is, is instructions given by God on how to sacrifice. Um, it's not there. That doesn't mean it ha didn't happen. It's just not recorded at this point. Um, and so... You have these two brothers that have different jobs, different access to offering materials. One is accepted and one is not. So why is one accepted and one is not is the question we're going to spend a little bit of time on today. Um, 
I've heard a lot of different versions of what, why it was accepted and why it wasn't. <clears throat> and up until like not too long ago, I thought it was something. And now I'm like, well, wait, that's different. And part of that reason that changed is because I read my Bible. And so, yeah, right? It, it, you, you open up a lot of things when you actually study and read the Bible. Um, that's one of the reasons we say a lot, like, don't just take our word for it. Um, study it yourself. Open your Bible. Read along. Because that's one of the, actually, the most interesting ways I've learned to study the Bible is to find things that don't make sense and then make them make sense. Um, it's really, it keeps you engaged, keeps you entertained. If you're just reading the Bible as a chore of like, okay, I have to do this today. I have to, you know, and you just skim through it and you don't actually read what's there. I mean, you miss a bunch of stuff. But if you, if you pay attention and read and you say, wait a minute, this, this doesn't match up with what I read here, then you read it and be like, oh, actually, it does match up. You just have to go here and here and it all makes sense. So what I was, um, I'm going to say taught, what I understood before was that Cain's offering was rejected because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. Um, Cain's offering, or Abel's offering, was an animal that had the shedding of blood, and how God required the shedding of blood for his offerings. It's not true. Um, we can see, if you turn to Leviticus chapter 2, there's not many times you turn to Leviticus in church, but this is going to be one of them. I'm going to have you turn a bunch of places today, too, because I think it's fun. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 2, and starting in verse 1. He says, when, everyone, when anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it into Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take sorry again, from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, is the most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. So you read down through this chapter, this is all about grain offerings. And if you actually go down to verse 14, it says, if you offer a grain offering of the first fruits of the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears, roasted with fire, crushed new, with crushed new grain. I assume that's either ears of wheat or ears of corn. I'm not sure exactly. But it's something that's grown um, that people are sacrificing or offering to God. Um, so it's not a matter of an unacceptable sacrifice, as in the, the material that's there. Um, so we have to look at, like, wait, if it's not that, what is it? And I think we get some commentary on it in the New Testament. If you go to uh, 11. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. If you beat me there, just hang out. It's fine. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than king, through which he was commended as, his, as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through faith, though he died, he still speaks. So I read that, and I can kind of see that there was an aspect of faith in Abel's offering that apparently wasn't in Cain's. Um, and what I like is that Hebrews here actually tells you what faith is before it actually tells you that he had faith. And so verse 1 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things unseen. So Abel's offering is an offering driven by faith of, I know God is going to do something. I know this is not just a useless ritual. Um, I know that this is for a purpose, and I know God is in control of that purpose. And his will is going to happen. Um, whatever he's going to do, I believe it. I'm behind it. This is, this is a uh, example of that. And I assume Cain's didn't have that. Um, so we see a, a few other instances in Scripture where God rejects sacrifices. This isn't just isolated to Cain, a one time event. Um, so I want to turn to some of them because they're some of the most interesting and scary verses in the Bible, I think. Um, so the first one, if you go to Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 11. I think it gives us a little more insight into what Cain was doing. 111. 
He says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. When you come before me, or come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure, or I, can, yeah, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. That's God's word to Israel there. Um, but he's saying, well, I'll read some more verses, and we'll talk about what he's saying. Um, go to Amos chapter 5, verse 22. I'm just going to read them all. Amos is in the middle of the Old Testament, well, kind of near the end of the Old Testament. I'm saying this because I can't remember. Say it, Joel. It's after Joel, Amos. Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Amos chapter 5. I'm highlighting a lot of the books that we forget about. This is, what, this is the purpose of today. You're like, what, that's in there? What? Where? Amos chapter 5 and starting in verse uh, 22. He says, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing ever stream. So there's that one. God saying the same thing to the people. And then we'll go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is the last book in your Old Testament. Actually, is it? Yes, yeah, chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 6. This is a little bit longer, but I'm going to read it, and it's fun. When I say fun, I don't mean fun at all. I don't know why I say that. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. This is God talking, by the way. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame and are sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there, may, oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle a fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting name, my, or setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered in my name, and a pure offering. All right, that's probably good for there. So, in all these instances, we see God addressing his people who have done what he's asked them to do by offering a sacrifice and saying, you're not getting it. You don't understand. Like, you're just going through the motions, and that's not what I want. Um, he even, we talked about a little bit about festivals and remembering during Sunday school. He even addresses festivals because the purpose of a festival was to remember back to what God has, had done for his people. And God says, you've forgotten the reason. Like, you're still having the festival, you're still having the, your Sabbath, but you have no motivation behind it. You've completely forgotten why you're doing this. You're forgetting why you're offering to me. Um, it's, it's just an empty gesture at this point. Your heart is not behind it. I don't, he says, I don't want it. Like, he says, I don't need all these burnt offerings. God doesn't need us to do that. So God's not sitting there with Cain and Abel and saying, if you don't get this right, I can't do what I'm supposed to do. He's saying, if you don't get this right, your relationship with me is broken even more. Um, and so Cain doesn't like it. Cain is sad because he doesn't do good. Um, sad is not the right word. It says furious, I think, right? He says very angry. Cain was very angry. And his face fell. It doesn't mean his face actually fell off of him. 
It's still attached. It's still there. He doesn't need a facelift. It's, it's all right there. He just looks really sad. He's despondent. He's like, oh, man. And so God, in his kindness and graciousness and lovingness, he, he goes after Cain, which, again, this is, the, this is really um, the second offense in the Bible to God. And you can see the first one. Did God wait for Adam and Eve to come to him? He, he, he found them. He went and got them. He doesn't wait for Cain to come to him. He, he goes after him and says, Cain, what, what's going on? Why do you look so sad? By the way, God knows why he looks sad. Just, just saying. Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will not it be accepted? Will not you be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. The next line I think is very interesting. Um, for a couple of reasons. It's the first, well, actually, going back, that line in verse 7, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. That's, that word sin, it's the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, too. Like we have sin in Adam and Eve, but the word sin at first appears right there. That's it. And so God said, it's waiting for you, it's crouching at the door. And then he says, its desire is contrary or toward you, depending on your translation, but you must rule over it. Does that sound familiar, that verse? Anybody heard that before? In Genesis 3.16, just the last chapter before that, that's the same language that God uses in the curse to Eve and to Adam and their consequences where he describes their relationship. Where he says, uh, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And so God tells this to Cain. He says, sin is desire is contrary to you, but you must rule, rule over it. That's very interesting to me. And, and part of it, why it's interesting is because I think a lot of people will take Genesis 3.16 and they use it as a, a prescriptive text of saying like, okay, this is what God says, that the woman's desire is to her, against her husband and he's going to rule over her. So that's, that's how we need to do it. That's, that's not actually what it's saying. And I think that's the reason for that. Like, I don't think God would use uh, the same phrase to describe a husband-wife relationship as he would sin trying to destroy somebody. Um, and so that verse in, that, in 3.16 is saying, this is the brokenness of your relationship. This is how, it, this, is, this is the result. Um, and in 4.7, when he says it, it's kind of the same idea. He's saying, sin wants to destroy you. You can't let it. Don't, it's, it's there. Like, it's desires right there. Who have to be on guard, and you have to make sure it doesn't happen. And so Cain's like, thank you, God. I would have messed up there. I appreciate it. Goes and hugs Abel. They make up. Everything's good. That's not what happened. But you were like, wait, what? Does that happen? So verse 8, things go from bad to worse here. Cain spoke to his Abel, not Abel brother. Cain spoke to his brother Abel. To Abel, his brother. My word. Why didn't they name him something else? It would have been much easier. He spoke, oh, I should just leave. <laughs> not going to get better. <laughs> Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. That's not a spoiler. Like, that's not a surprise, right? Everybody knew that. Like, this is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Like, even non-believers know who Cain and Abel are. So I, I hope that nobody was like, oh, goodness, didn't see that coming. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Again, God knows where his brother is. And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Also a very famous line in pop culture today even. <clears throat> and the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, well, we'll stop right there for now. So, <clears throat> this is obviously not great. <laughs> um, and I think it's interesting, the first attack that Satan launches on humanity is to attack the relationship between God and humanity. Can you really trust him? You know, is that really accurate? 
And the second attack is launching on man's relationship to each other. Um, relationships can tear down a lot. And I don't think that's lost here. Um, so Cain makes a bad choice. This is where it gets interesting again. So Cain kills Abel. And this translation, I think there's another translation that says he asked him to go out into the field. Not just like while they were out there, but he was like, come out in the field with me. Um, Abel doesn't really have a lot of reason to be out in the field. He, he works with sheep. He, he's not, not a field guy. Well, I guess there are sheep in the field. So, I don't know. I don't know what Cain's angle is exactly, <clears throat> but it's not good. Um, and so he kills him. He, he rises up and he kills his brother. I don't know how he does it. For a long time, I thought maybe he didn't know what he was doing. Maybe, maybe he, like, I mean, if these are the first, if, you know, if nobody's died yet, maybe he didn't know it was going to kill him. Maybe, but I think he knew exactly what he was doing um, because they, they knew how to kill things. Um, we just, like, Abel's sacrifice of his animal, like, he knew how to kill things. So he had a good idea what was going to happen. That being said, um, let's keep going. In verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. And then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Nod means wanderer, by the way, which is interesting. <clears throat> um, Cain's reaction here is very interesting to me, where he, he doesn't show any remorse. He does, like, God punishes him, and he's not like, I'm sorry I did that, or, or like, oh, man, yeah, I really messed up. He complains about his punishment, not... There's no defense. He doesn't offer defense. I mean, I think that was probably smart because it's God. And there's a limited amount of people on the earth right now, so it's not like he can blame a lot of other people. Um, but he, he has no remorse for his actions. He just cares about himself and his own punishment. It's like, oh, this is too hard, God. All I did was kill, a, kill my brother. Like, and, and you're going to do this to me? Like, he plays the victim. Like, he's like, oh, what? Um, and I think it's interesting. This is why I think it's interesting, because... There's a very specific set of rules and regulations we get to Exodus on the punishment for murder and, the, and how that looks. So let's just look at that really quick. So Exodus chapter 21, I'm going to make you turn some more. Exodus is right after Genesis, so it's not too far a trip for your fingers. Just flip right down there. Twenty-one, verse twelve. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. That's very blunt. Very, it's just right there. Um, the next verse is interesting. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, and then, then I will appoint a place for you. Then I appoint a place. Hold on. Then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from the altar that he may die. God is very clear here that if you murder somebody, the penalty is death. And it's not just there. Um, there's a couple other sections that talks about that. Cain's still alive. God doesn't kill him. Like, the, if the penalty for murder is death, why is he still there? And honestly, like, we go, go to Numbers chapter 35 real quick. Again, Numbers is a book you never turn to. Like, that's the book you stop at at your Bible reading plan in the year because it's just, it's Numbers. You just can't get through it. It's too much boring stuff. Although I was reading this to Ellis, I think, yesterday. Um, I think this is this part of it. No, actually, it was part about sacrifices. And he enjoyed it because it's very morbid. Um, <laughs> like, I would not suggest reading that if you're a vegetarian. <laughs> Just saying, you're going to have some issues. Chapter 35, and starting in verse 10. Uh, I think this is it. Yeah. 
Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills a person without intent may flee there. The cities shall be for you a refuge from the avenger. And the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation of the judgment. So I'm going to skip down. Let's see. So my point in that is basically that Cain's punishment for his action lines up more with the punishment for manslaughter than it does murder. But, but, we'll keep reading. In verse 16 of Numbers 35, it says, but if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. Murderer shall be put to death. If he struck him down with a stone tool that causes death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Um, the avenger of blood shall himself put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. So there's a lot of death here. Like I said, we just talked about the resurrection, and I'm just going to keep piling on the death. It's, <clears throat> it's just how things worked out. Um, verse 20 is interesting. If he pushed him out of hatred or hurled something at him, lying in wait so that he died, or in enmity struck him down with his hands so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. That sounds like what Cain did. Yeah. Like, I don't know exactly how he killed his brother, but that sounds very similar to um, the story. He definitely pushed him out of hatred, or, or hurt him out of hatred. Um, he sounds like a murderer. He doesn't sound like a good guy. But he's not punished like a murderer. Um, if you go to Matthew chapter 7, we'll just go some New Testament really quick. One more talk about murder. It's like we're playing a game of Clue here or something. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Wait, no. Matthew chapter 5. I knew I was going to do that. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. There we go. Just kidding. You have heard it said, this is Jesus talking, by the way, you have heard it said that to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, Jesus takes it one step further and says, Cain was guilty of murder when he got angry at his brother. That's the first step. Um, and that's kind of what God is telling Cain in his warning, is saying, hey, like, I can see where your heart's at. It's not leading to a good place. Sin is right there, just waiting to destroy you. It's obvious. It's on display. Don't do it. And Cain just keeps going down the track and destroys his brother. So why does that matter? Why, like, why does this punishment matter? And the way I read it, the way I see this, like, if he was on trial, I would convict him for murder um, based on the evidence. He looks like a murderer, but he's not punished like a murderer. And the only thing I can attribute to that is a merciful God to say, I'm going to give you another chance, basically. I'm going to give you a chance to live out your life. Now, Cain, Cain's life is played out, and it doesn't play out very far, I would say, as far as his lineage. Um, but we'll get to that in a second, too. So one thing we have to talk about for a quick second here I, I don't think I need to say this, but I kind of do. We're going to go to verse um, 15. This is God saying, then the Lord said to him, not so. This is after Cain is like, I can't do that. Like, somebody's going to kill me. Somebody's going to find me and kill me. He says, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put the mark of Cain on, on Cain, lest anyone find him should attack him. Now, we've got to do this, because this is something that has been taught in certain areas of the world or certain churches throughout history, and is a complete lie and completely false. The mark of Cain was not his skin color, and that's something that people have said, that this dark skin came from the mark of Cain. That is a lie. It's not true. If anybody tells you that, I was going to say something. Just tell them they're lying. And that they're not accurate, because it's not true. Um, but it has been taught. So I just needed to dispel it right now. Like, there's no evidence of that. And wh why do I know that? Because you have two lines now, okay? You have kids of Adam and Eve. You've got Cain, you've got Abel. 
Abel's dead. Cain continues to live for a while, and then you have a replacement kid. <laughs> it's a bad term, but but it's there. <laughs> like like okay, just go to chapter five. That's how the Bible describes him, basically. That's how Eve describes him. All right. Chapter 5, we'll skip ahead really quick. When Adam, or verse 3 of chapter 5, when Adam lived 130 years, <laughs> that was really bad, I'm sorry. He fathered a son in his own image, or his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. Um, where is it? Hold on. Oh, wait, it's the end of one. So you got Seth. Seth is the kid. Um, in verse 25 of chapter 4, is the first time we see him, it says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. So, so Eve basically says, God has replaced Cain with, or Cain replaced Abel with Seth. So that's why I said replacement. I wasn't trying to be weird. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, um, Seth's line is the rest of the Bible. Um, that's where it goes. So you've got Seth and his descendants, and you can follow them out. They go through Noah. Noah's family comes from Seth. How many families saved in the ark? Spoiler alert, we haven't got there yet, but how many families? One. Just one, just Noah's family, right? There were no stragglers in there. So Cain's family, where did they go? Unless they can swim really well, they do not survive the flood. Now the only way their line survives, and this is, this is something that could be out there, is if one of Noah's sons marries one of Cain's descendants. And that possibly happen somewhere in there, but, but probably not. So Cain's line dies at the flood. It's over. That, that, that's, that's it. Um, and then Noah's line keeps going. So if Cain's line dies at the flood, <laughs> and the theory, the wrong, erroneous teaching of like, well, dark skin came from Cain, how'd that happen? Like, no, it just ended. Okay? So anyway, that part's over now. You can tell people that. It's great. So, we've got these two lines set up from this story, basically. And this is the whole point of the story. As I'm reading this, I'm like, why is this in here? Why, why, like, I, I mean, I guess it makes sense. Moses is sitting down with the people going into Israel. He's telling them their, their family history. This is your family history. This is where everything comes from. Um, by the way, he gave them Ten Commandments. So he's like, this is a really good um, example of why you don't murder. That's in the Ten Commandments. So, don't murder. This is a story for that. Um, I think that's one reason for it. Um, and I think them knowing how, how corrupt Cain was and how that line went is important for them to know. And that comes back in chapter 6 um, in that declaration that God says, Verse 5 of chapter 6, he says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. That's Cain's lineage. That's his, that's his, his contribution to the earth. Um, when God addresses him after he kills Abel, and Cain is completely indifferent and just worried about himself, that's, that's a heart that is intentionally wicked all the time. Like, like that's there. Um, and... This is Moses trying to explain this to the people as they go in. Um, and there's a bunch more stuff in there, obviously. Like, I had to edit a lot of stuff out of this because it can get really, really crazy. Um, but one thing, one thing I think is really, really important to see um, that I've never seen before while I was reading this, but it jumped out at me while I was studying <clears throat> is... Maybe, maybe this isn't as big a deal to you, but it, it seems important to me. Let's see, where is it? Verse 16 of chapter 4. It says, Then Cain, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. I think it's important to recognize that the presence of the Lord is still there. That, that um, he didn't kick Adam and Eve out of Eden and then just leave them. Um, and I don't know if I've ever thought about that before. But he's still actively involved in the lives of his people, even after the fall. He didn't go anywhere. He's just there. Um, and he's a huge part of their life. So that, that was really kind of neat for me to see. The other thing I think this is in there for, and this is what we'll close with, 
Um, this, this story, I think it shows the seriousness that God has for the ways he's given us to build our relationship with him. Um, the offering, like I said, was not for God. It was for his people. That ritual was a way of God. The God put that there as a way to build the relationship with him. And so when it's mistreated or when it's not applied correctly, it's a big deal. And so I think it's important for us to look as a church at the ways God has given us to build a relationship with him and make sure we're treating those how we're supposed to. That we're not just gathering in vain on a Sunday. Um, that we're, we're not just reading our Bible because it's just what we have to do as Christians. That there's a motivation behind it and that motivation is to maintain the relationship with God. Um, because that's where Cain messed up. He didn't have any intention other than maybe a little bit of fear and maybe obligation um, to maintain that relationship. God doesn't want our, <laughs> I've said this before, God doesn't want our begrudging submission to his tasks. It doesn't glorify him. He doesn't want us to have to drag our feet and be like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but oh, it's just what I have to do right now. Um, that doesn't bring him honor or glory or anything. It doesn't show the true character of God to bring us into a closer relationship with him for his glory and for our benefit. So that's, that's kind of what I wanted to close with today is just examining and, and, and just making sure that what we're doing as believers has the motivation behind it um, to bring glory and honor to God and to bring us closer to God and not just because... That's what we have to do in order to maintain like some semblance of a charade of a relationship with God. Nice, happy message. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to tell you it gets better, <laughs> but it really doesn't for a while. Um, it does eventually, but you got to hang in there and wait for it. All right. Everybody stand while we're getting set up up here. That was a lot of really great things to be thinking about, Ben. Um, one of the things that caught my attention as we go into the song, yet not I, but Christ, through Christ in me. And we only bring an acceptable offering of worship by faith. And where do we have faith from? Mm -hmm. You know, by the gift of God. And none of us please him without Christ mm -hmm. working through us. So this week, maybe bring him an offering of worship by faith through Christ in me.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this time that we've had together. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us through this week. Help us to see the opportunities that you provide us over the next week of ways that we can share you and the hope that we have inside us with those around us. Lord, we know that this is a dark and scary place at times, and we thank you for being with us through everything that we go through. And we love you so much, and thank you for everything that you've blessed us with. In your name, amen.